Hello, everyone, and welcome to a little special episode. You know, it's getting to the end of the year. Um, we're seeing a lot move. This is like the busiest time of the year for seeing movies. So much, so much to see. Um, there's a lot of movies we've seen in like the last month, month and a half that um, we haven't had the chance to like have a full like review discussion about it. I think we've touched on our thoughts on a lot of these films briefly during live streams and discussions, but like never just completely focused on it. So we've got a little review recap coming for you. We've got tons, as you can probably see by the title, of movies to talk about here. Um, so yeah, are, are you ready to get into it, Anthony? I'm ready. On Wednesdays, okay. we wear pink, unless it's not Wednesday. Oh, I just Christmas. noticed. <laughs> yes, we're ready. Is it, what, oh, yeah. I feel well, like what day off? it's really like between watching all your holiday favorites and also catching up with the best of 2023. It's just like these two different categories of movies. You have like a wealth of picks. Like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. I feel like it's it's too much sometimes, but we're gonna try our best. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, we've got a lot to talk about, as as you will see. Let's start off with the one I've most recently seen. Um, let's start off with Anatomy of a Fall. Um, let, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this first entry. I don't know how much we've touched on it before in the live stream, so I, I don't really know where you stand on it. What did you think of this film? Yes, um, I thoroughly enjoyed this film. I really appreciated that this was definitely a more European take on a courtroom drama, but one I think that really mm -hmm. um, cements the characters in the foreground and what the experience is like going through this sort of ordeal. Um, and frankly, what I think the movie reveals itself to be is whether it's not really a question of whether somebody did this or didn't do it whether they're found guilty mm -hmm. or innocent, it's the perception of the person that changes throughout the process, not only because they have to endure this pr process, but the people around them, specifically in this film, Sandra Hewler's son, is really yeah. confronted with this image of his mother that might not even be true. And I think what uh, Justine Triette does as the uh, writer and director here is really puts you into that scenario and doesn't kind of do any flashy theatrics. You really feel like you're in this courtroom and i just this idea of trying to prove your integrity maybe not even your innocence but your integrity i thought was really yeah. strong here um it's a, it's incredibly acted uh, there's one scene with sandra Hewler and the actor who plays her husband that i thought was remarkable yep. it feels very true um and i think that the the young actor who you may milo something or another I apologize. milo i think makato i'm i might mispronouncing it milo makato grander i think yeah yeah i think he's he incredible. does a great job of really coming of age on screen in a movie that doesn't necessarily belong to him he really use it uses his time well yeah um and so yeah i thought this was a film that once you kind of understand what it's going to, I think we've been trained with these sort of movies to like expect certain scenes and, you know, they're very flashy, especially American courtroom dramas. I think this, la the last frame of this film is a character just laying on a bed. And in that moment, you realize that what happened in this movie doesn't, doesn't end. It doesn't conclude. They live with this experience forever. And to me, I felt that was a very appropriate way to tackle this sort of experience on film. So I, I thought this was a, it's a film that will stay with you. It'll just stay. It'll. It, I think these are strong characters. Um, great editing. Great screenplay. Um, yeah, I, I really like this one a lot. And I think Sandra Huller, who I'm sure you'll touch on, is just remarkable in this role. She's playing so many different characters depending on whose perception, whose point of view we're looking at her through, including her own. Um, I really enjoyed this one. Yeah, yeah. I really like this one too. This is definitely, I think, going to make my top 10 of the year. Um, I love a good courtroom drama. I love movies that... Um, leave stuff ambiguous and allow you to come to your own decisions. They don't spell things out for you. I love a mysterious death, but I think, I think this is much more than a courtroom drama. I think even more so than a courtroom drama, I think it might be more of a family drama, mm -hmm. like through the, um, the eyes of a courtroom drama. Um, as you said, it's such an accurate depiction of just like emotions and conversations and how things actually play out in life. It's not like theatrical, it's grounded, it's realistic. There's a lot of subtext that um, Triate leaves for the audience to um, dig into themselves. Um, I don't understand. I forget where it missed. I don't understand how this is missing any screenplay category because the dialogue, everything, the um, the way everything plays out, it's an incredible screenplay. Um, but I think the standout, as you mentioned, is the acting. I think acting might be the most, acting and performance might be the singular most important thing to a film for me personally in terms of my taste of film. Um, and there's just something about 
all of these actors here, seeing incredibly talented actors just do all of the work in creating and crafting their character down to the smallest and most simple of moments that um, just leave you so enraptured and captivated. And Sandra Huller, maybe performance of the year. This is incredible. I think sometimes we get so caught up like with performances like um, like Bradley Cooper, Emma Stone, some of these like big ostentatious the ones with bravado people. and you know bravado movie yeah acting. these big these big performances um like showy acting that i think sometimes we forget how effective it can be to see a really talented actor delivering during delivering like a truly grounded truthful realistic portrayal of a person and just how deeply real that can feel and how sometimes even more effective it can feel. I, I think she just, everything. And there's one live line delivery in particular um, during that fight scene, which I think is the highlight of the film. I, I, it's like the, your generosity conceals something dirtier and meaner. And the way she delivers that has just been stuck in my head forever. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, the line delivery on that is amazing. Everyone in here is incredible. As you mentioned, her son, Milo, um, I think Mikado Grainer is his name. Um, Wow, wow. I don't understand um, how a kid at that age can deliver that kind of performance. Um, I think in some way it could kind of be seen as his film as well. Um, but I, I don't know. There's just a few scenes, especially towards the end, like insane, especially like the crying scene. Incredible acting. I think he will definitely make my personal supporting lineup. And another performance I didn't, I don't know how they did it. Snoop the dog. I was about to say. Particular, <laughs> that it's like, how do you get a dog to do that? I don't understand. I need to, whoever trained that dog is incredible. I mean, that's, that's, I don't know how they did that, but he's, yeah. I, yeah. And I mean, even her um, lawyer, I think his, he's played by um, Swin, Swin Arlod. He's very good in it. Uh, the other lawyer, you hate him. He does a great job at being just a total asshole. Um, everyone in here is really good. Acting incredible. Story's incredible. I really liked it. I don't really have many complaints. I just, um, I, I don't think it like, does a bunch to like rise above i don't think it's like changing the game at anything i just think it does what it's set out to do and like executes on that like very well and i just i really liked it yeah the only thing i would have pause a little bit i remember when i first saw, i've seen this film like two months ago and so mm -hmm. i think when i first came out of it i felt a little bit like i had a distance to sandra hewler's character that i didn't okay. necessarily appreciate because at, it felt to me that the part of the movie was about her experience going through this. And if what happens at the end is what, you know, if that was the truth, then why weren't we more in her head more? But again, I think when I started to look at it through her, the eyes of her son and even the idea that mm -hmm. he doesn't know, it, it's hard for you to pinpoint like these little details of your life as if they are the central tenets of your existence. And I also like how they bring in the idea of your creations, both artistically and your children, are not necessarily yeah. who you are. And I think that the correlation between the two um, was really fascinating. So I think it's a movie that, again, it's, it's more disrupting the type of structural catharsis you'll get from a courtroom drama and therefore yeah. it achieves something so much greater. Yeah, yeah. I loved it. I hope it gets all the uh, all the awards love. Um, I think probably when we do our personal awards, do pretty decently there. Um, mm -hmm. Let's move on to another film that um, we have seen recently, The Holdovers, which is another movie I would say similar to Anatomy of a Fall. Um, it doesn't like do anything like too groundbreaking or risky, but I think it does what it set out to do very well at, at like peak top condition. Um, once again, the act acting is just so important. The acting in here, these three main actors, Paul Giamatti, Dominic Sessa, Devine Joy Randolph, all incredible, all do a great job of um, giving like these really grounded and realistic characters. Um, you feel you feel th that they're very human and they're very three-dimensional. Um, and this is really, I think, a two-hander. I wish Devine had more um, screen time, but I think it's really between these two as we see. Oh. These two, as we see on the screen. Damarian is very um, upset with you calling it a two-hand. <laughs> she, she's, I think, the standout for me personally. I think she, uh, there's something about her as an actress that um, just, she Long has one. that it factor. Yeah, and you just your eyes are constantly drawn to her and everything she does. Um, she just does an incredible job. Um, but yeah, what what do you think of this movie? Yeah, I think that this film and The Color Purple actually go hand in hand because they're both movies about how okay happiness and pain kind of go in tandem because i think mm -hmm. all these characters are suffering a lot of loss 
but at the same time, this is a very funny film. And I think the pain, uh, mm -hmm. the pain from Alexander Payne uh, comes from a real genuine place. Uh, and I think he's yeah. able to source that very well. Uh, Howie Mandel always said that comedy often comes from a dark place. And I think that's why this is such an effective piece of work. Um, yeah. yeah, I thought this, again, terrifically acted. I think that it's a type of movie that you just enjoy being in the presence of these characters. Really, it just to me, this is a film that it's 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 definitely a coming of age story, but I also think it's a type of narrative where the characters realize that they're stuck and trying to move forward. And mm -hmm. yeah, I just thought again, sharply written, very acu just so acutely real. Um, I thought the some of the techniques to give it that sort of antiqueish vibe and yeah. between the aesthetic, between the cinematography, the the MPAA card coming up at the beginning. I just it was a very cozy film. Um, but at the same time, it, it, there were moments of darkness, and I really appreciate yeah. the, the tonal balance of that. It was, it, it's a, it's. I feel like you'll hear the phrase that they don't make these type of movies anymore. Like they don't make them like this anymore because I think mm -hmm. people don't like to exist in both of these camps. Like you have to be clear in your binary, and I think this one kind of walks that high wire act of being able to do both, and that's why I think it's really connected with people as it did for the two of us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... I think it's a, gr a great new Christmas movie to end the rotation. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, I, I think I think everyone in your family can enjoy this. I think this is a pretty universal film. Um, and yes, yeah, as, as you said, performances, I think, carry the whole thing. Um, there's one handshake at the end that I was expecting a hug, but it was a handshake that mm -hmm. I think is one of the more emotional moments of the film, surprisingly. Who knew a handshake could be so powerful? Um, and yeah, I, I, just, I just really liked it. I don't really have much to say on it, besides I thought it was was well done. I don't think it's anything like groundbreaking, but I thought it was, it was a good time. Um, so yeah. I do think that it's the type of dynamic that I feel like the dynamic between teacher and student, like we've seen a lot of stories about that. This one really stuck out to me because it really made clear how much impact an educator can have. Like you spend so much time mm -hmm. with them, especially given the context of this scenario where, you know, he's holding over for Christmas. Yeah. I just really respected that when you get deeper into somebody, it's not going to, you're not going to learn all the wonderful details. You're going to learn all the stuff mm -hmm. that they kind of hide away, but yeah. that only makes them more human, but it makes your relationship stronger. Um, yeah. I thought that the main dynamic and how it approached this very pregnant time in somebody's maturation was very mm -hmm. true to life. Yeah, and for a first on-screen performance, Dominic Sessa is very, very good in here. I think this is also one of Paul Giamatti's best performances. I am um, both very good in this. Both leads, Dominic Sessa should not be supporting, but both <laughs> both two great co-leads here, and Divine Joy Randolph, um, a huge standout as well. Um, so let's move on to a film that I think we've agreed on the first two films thus far. <laughs> I think we might be on a little bit of different grounds. I don't know how far off with um, Saltburn. Um, Emerald Fennell's sophomore feature with Barry Keegan, um, Keoghan, uh, Barry Keegan, Barry K, um, <laughs> Barry K, Barry K, um, Jacob Elordi, uh, Rosamund Pike, and and them all of them. Um, I'll let you start on this. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen the film twice, and I'm glad I did okay. because I do think it's yeah. the type of film that certain develops, de developments make you see the film in a completely different way. I'm not mm -hmm. similar to Promising Young Woman. I think that yeah. Will Fennell is a type of filmmaker who I think is aware that film is a, um, it's a cyclical process and that like mm -hmm. you like to rewatch movies and seep more into them. It's not something that you see once and then you pass on, which I, I, I appreciate. Uh, yeah. yeah, first off, I want to get it out of the way that I think the craft of this film is rather impeccable linus sangren's mm -hmm. uh or lena sangren cinematography i just thought was stunning i love the the academy ratio because it really confines the characters and creates this claustrophobia that the movie comments on um i really felt that the production design was very effective in placing me at saltburn at this castle and uh yeah just I, the costumes i loved the just this movie is really about coming. It, the, Saltburn is a character, really, is probably the main character. Yeah. And I think the movie doesn't work unless you really feel that you're in this environment. And I think that 
Fennell definitely graduates from Promising Young Woman in really directing all of these components to success. On that note, I think that that's really what the movie's about for me and why I really enjoy the film, because it's talking about how these that place and the, the characteristics of a given place define success and what happens when somebody is so in love with the ideas of things rather than actual reality. You know, Barry mm -hmm. Keoghan is in love with the idea of Jacob Elordi's character more than Jacob Elordi himself, given that Jacob Elordi kind of disappears for like a large section of the middle yeah. of the movie. And he's in love with the idea of Saltburn rather than any of the people involved. And to me, I think that's a rather appropriate dissection of class because class in the end, it's not necessarily about the activity or whatever. It's just the idea of being rich that I think tantalizes people and strives them into very questionable moral behaviors. And so I really like that perspective. I feel like a lot of times there's a, there's a moral correlation between like certain stories of the haves and the have nots. And a lot of times you'll see that, you know, the poor is always altruistic and the rich are always mean. And while, while I think that is worthy and there's definitely a lot of behavior that can support that, I like that this story was not interested in giving us a, a story about classism in the same way. It's more interested, in, again, it's taking out the personality of class because a lot of times it has nothing to do with personality. It's about this idea that we've cooked up in our heads. Um, and so to me, Barry Keoghan's character and his performance, it was a fascinating character study to see him fool himself even more and more. And I also really thought, I won't spoil it, but the framing device is very clever because you think that it's very reflective and it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's it's him mm -hmm. convincing himself more and more of these ideas that may be true or not, but he's convinced that they are because that's what he sees as success. I think setting this film at a very elite college is also part of that. So uh, yeah, to me, this was just somebody falling more and more in love with themselves. It's a very narcissistic film. And I think that it's the type of film that you that people will want to look away from because it's not it's not an easy film. And I also think it doesn't present the story like with an easy way out. Like a lot of times with class stories, like they'll show you the door, which most audience members would take. So like, oh, this is where we would have drifted apart and I'm not going to turn into this guy. And Fennell yeah. is not interested in that. I think that's what's offsetting about this movie to some people, but it's what I really enjoyed about it. And I also think, again, it's some, there's something to be said about telling a story in an effective, entertaining way. I was thoroughly entertained throughout this movie. I think the performances are just so, just absolutely off the walls and it, in the best way. Um, I really loved Carrie Mulligan is in this movie for like 10 seconds and yeah. she is so funny. Um, and I really did. I was impressed with Barry Keoghan. I think this is just another wonderful, remarkable performance from mm -hmm. the actor. So yeah, I, I think that pretty much sums up my thoughts. Again, I don't think the film is without reproach. Obviously it's been mm -hmm. very divisive. Um, but to me, whenever I sit down to watch it, it's, it even like all these things that we may talk about, they kind of float away. I just enjoy the experience of Saltburn. I like that it's this just rambunctious wild card. And yeah, it's, it's more, I think she creates such a visceral feeling within the two hour runtime um, that I just, I really did enjoy this movie and I will never forget that last scene. Not since after sun, do I think yeah. one last shot just fully captures the movie so well and bears all in many ways to show just what she's trying to say with this and that there's so much focus on artifice and on possession and control more than anything else. Controlling things that don't even have any semblance of what they're actually, like what they actually mean. Like he's controlling inanimate objects as if they're people. Um, and so, yeah, I just, this one, I don't know, this one really, really, really worked for me and it's worked for me multiple times. This is a movie that, this is the most I've struggled with my thoughts on a movie in a long time. Because while watching it, like you said, I had a great time. I think it's very entertaining. Um, like you said, it's very, oh, she's always interrupting me, that God. I'm not going to say her name. Um, it's very entertaining. Um, it's very pro provocative. Um, I was, there were some shocking moments. It's a fun theatrical experience seeing all of that stuff and seeing how the audience reacts. Um, like you said, the craft is incredible cinematography production design it's uh, it's stunning to look at um very very one of i think easily the best shot films of the year the acting is really good like you said barry barry keoghan just can't give a bad performance um jacob Elordi, i think does the best job with 
creating an actual realistic characters but i'll say i think some of them likes a rosamund pike who's great in the film or a richard e grant feel a little more character -y. um whereas i think jake valori's character feels very realistic to me um and human yeah. allison oliver who plays his sister very good in the film honestly i i, I lots of people talk about rosamund pike being the supporting actress standout she was the standout for me allison oliver especially there's one monologue towards the end mm -hmm. in a bathtub that is just incredible um, it would be a perfect acting clip if she were nominated. She won't be, but um, great stuff there. Um, pretty much every, I think he, she directs the film very well, very good as well. The issues I have with it are all down to the script. It's just, I, like I said, I had a great time while watching it, but then I look back at all these things, all of these like shocking moments, and I'm just like, I don't see the motivation behind them besides pure shock value. I don't, I don't think it's... A, if this is a film about class commentary, which I'm, I, I don't think it really is, but if it is, I don't think the commentary, um, I don't want to spoil things, but I don't think the commentary completely works, especially given what we think of Barry Keoghan's character and then what um, we come to learn of him and um, what it has to say about like people aspiring for the rich. It almost feels like, like um, a a scary story to tell rich people to be afraid of these people it's almost like the rich people are like the more sympathetic characters in this um which i i think emerald Fennell, given where she comes from financially maybe shouldn't uh should maybe think a little harder with some of these um these themes um i don't know i just had i just don't think it's when i think on it i just don't think it's saying much and if it is saying something I don't think it does a good job at saying it. I think it might actually do a bad job, but um, well, everything else about it, I really liked. My one thing I would give pause to is that I, because I heard that this is like a story where like the, it's a warning for rich people. Like mm -hmm. the person telling the story at the point in his life when he's telling the story is a rich person. Yeah. And I also think yeah. what I thought was very smart about it is that when we actually get to go into this certain character's life, it's completely normal and financially very sound. Yes, it's not the extravagance mm -hmm. of Saltburn, but there's nothing, yeah. it's not like Parasite where, you know, the bathroom is overflowing and there's like, it's mm -hmm. it's this awful state, like cultural and social stance. Like to me, I think, this is why I think we talked about it before. Like, I don't see the story as like commenting on the haves and the have nots. It's about the perversion of wealth and how it grabs a hold of people. And to me, I think it, there's a clever um, image of this like labyrinth, this maze. And that's a lot of times what it is. It's a bunch of bumbling idiots kind of going around a maze, trying to find their way out, trying to understand what it all means. And this one figure coming in and being like, well, I can be what you need and I can be what you need and I can be what you need because frankly, just being of use is what I need. Um, and mm -hmm. that parasitical relationship depicting the the journey of becoming affluent and ridiculously wealthy as this sort of parasitical relationship, I thought worked. Um, so th that would be my one thing about this, you know, the poor versus the rich thing. Again, the story is yeah. told from the perspective of a poor person. No, but then I think when you th consider his perspective, I just don't, I don't know what she's trying to say then if that person is like, is it like beware of the upper middle mm -hmm. class? I, I just don't know exactly. <laughs> Your parents what, are um, upper middle. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Upper well, middle. Like um, I, I think I brought it up before. I think, you know, we look at like, there are so many people that didn't start from wealth that have become wealthy mm -hmm. and done terrible things um, yeah. and, or people who were at one level and then just increased it exponentially. Um, I think I, and I would say the harm of what the characters do in this movie isn't necessarily, you know, it, it isn't necessarily about like the money they have. It's that the, it's, it's a lot of times it's about using their wealth, from escaping from actually communicating with each other, that nobody's being honest with each other and Barry Keoghan kind of exploits that.
that nobody mm -hmm. actually has. They're all on this, you know, the scene with Carrie Mulligan, I think is so effective because they're, they're not actually telling her what they're telling her. They're trying to, yeah. you know, be prim and proper and nice. And it's like, nobody's actually existing here. And Barry Keoghan's like, well, then if you aren't all being honest with each other, then why do I have to be honest with you? And why do, why can't we live in this fairy tale? It's a very, it's a, it's a story where the character kind of, realizes he come to that realization be, then. Something different to all of you and that's okay i don't then means i don't even know who i am anymore i think he goes into this movie very early on with a plan so i don't know how many that's that's i think another issue with this film i think i would maybe be more on its wavelength if i could understand the oliver character more i think he's very mysterious and he's very hard to read i think maybe a second watch would help knowing now how everything plays out mm -hmm. like seeing what he's doing on a second watch i mean i could completely flip on the film but yeah. i just find his performance and his character to be so mysterious and hard to read and unpredictable that i don't understand his motivations or like his wants so i can't really be very invested in the drama or anything that's at stake because i don't really care about him because i don't know yeah. anything about him I think so it's I think more that is what he says emotionally is not during the narrative of the film isn't always basically what he means. He's definitely hiding things. I think from an, there's an early image where he looks out a window and there's like uh, Lena Sangren and Fennell have like framed him in a way where you see like multiple versions of his face. And to me, that's yeah. all I needed as far as this is a character first off coming to Oxford, which already tells you that he's aspiring to this level of greatness from a statue mm -hmm. that maybe he wasn't necessarily in. He's obviously not welcomed when he gets, it's very, you know, Ron Weasley coming to Hogwarts, yeah. Draco Malfoy coded. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that from that moment on, you can see that he feels that the only way he's going to be respected, the only way that he's going to live a life where he doesn't have to be ashamed of himself, he feels is by deserving Saltburn. Um, and that's kind of where he starts and then the journey of how he tries to claim it. So that, that, again, when you see it a second time, knowing what you know about the character, I feel like it's not, it's, he doesn't even really arc in a way. It's more that it's just how far will he succumb? How far will he go down this path of proving that what he wants at the beginning is really what he needs by the end is how I kind of look at it. It's not, it's not a fall from grace. He was already fallen in a way from the first frame. Mm -hmm. and that's just who this character is. And again, I think that's not the type of character we like to see. Usually we see, you know, a character have great aspirations at the beginning and then succumb. I think or some sort of arc at least. At I don't know how much of an arc he even has. And I think our main character should usually at least have at least a little bit of an arc. Usually. I think he has like, a class arc, but I don't know if he has like a personal emotional arc. But I, but I also don't, it's not necessary. I feel like if your movie, like, listen, if you're Disney's wish, yes, it's weird that none of those characters mm -hmm. arc in that movie. Um, yeah. I think they're, this one, again, I, I it's an unconventional arc. I still think that he, 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 he definitely grows in the movie because I think there are certain things he would have done with more trepidation um, at the beginning that he doesn't at the end. Um, again, it's that re it's, I think there's a scene with him and Jacob Elordi where it's, he's, he just realizes that like, you know, I don't have complete control unless I have salt burn in a way. Like, mm -hmm. why is it that you get to decide my happiness, but I can't decide yours. Um, and that I'm always following you. You're never following me. Um, mm -hmm. so anyway, I, what I, again, I appreciate this movie again from a craft level. I think that it has. Mm -hmm. It's doing things differently with its narrative structure that I really like. Um, and besides, I think just it's just one of the more interesting films, one of the more entertaining films of the year. So it's definitely one that I look back on. I appreciate that, you know, there's that old thing of the movie. If the movie offends somebody, then, you know, you're doing something right. Um, mm -hmm. and I think this is a movie that kind of proves that thesis true. Yeah, I, I respect the film. I think I really might need a rewatch to completely cement my thoughts on it because I I can think of the stuff you're saying. I just don't know if I completely think that was there on the first watch, but maybe I might see that on a second watch. Yeah. Um, and right the, now, first watch, I was I like I started loving it, and then I fell off a little bit. But then that last shot mm -hmm. to me was just so perfect, and I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, this shot. is exactly this sort of reveling and like being in your own world like to me like that shot really encompassed the whole movie and it got me back in the same with it after sun i was like i liked after sun 
but I was searching a little bit for the meaning. And then that last shot when Paul Mesco walks and you see like the, the strobing lights of the party, it's like, right. oh my God, like everything became clear. Um, and then, yeah, seeing it a second time definitely helps. Um, it's one of the more rewatchable movies of the season for me, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll need to watch it again. But yeah, I respect, like you said, the craft. I think the acting is really good. Um, one of the best ensembles of the year. Um, I just, I still have issues with the script. I think right now where I stand on the film, it could change where um, when I see it another time. But the the simplest way I put it down to is, I forget the exact wording. I think I may have said this to you before. The way Rosamund Pike's character describes Carrie Mulligan's character is how I would describe the film. I think she says something like, on like the surface, it looks so like pretty and attracting and alluring, but deep down, but beneath inside, there's really nothing going on. Is right now, I think what I think of the film. I love so much of the texts and acting and all that. I just, at the end of the day, I look back on it, especially because I can't connect to the Barry Keegan character or his motivations or what he wants. He's a mystery. Um, the other characters, I don't think you can, besides maybe Jacob Elordi, have any connection or empathy for. Um, and I don't, the motivations don't make sense to me. Um, I don't really understand what it's trying to say. I don't, I think it's a little vain right now is what I'd say, but I, I'm open to I think to that, that comes thing. from no, usually in a story like this, you'll have an audience surrogate. And this is a movie mm -hmm. that she's not interested in giving an all, which supports her. Like she believes that like, every, she said in interviews that like, there's a darkness in all of us. And I think that's the yeah. type of point of view that people, definitely Hollywood, doesn't tend to want to give out. And I think that's maybe what we're seeing too a little bit is this idea that we have, usually we have a character to latch onto and see through their eyes. Mm -hmm. And the characters that we do have, really, we don't want to see through their eyes. And I yeah. think that's, that's part of her intent to really unease us and that what would we do in this situation? That's what I, I always talk about the scene in The Dark Knight where like they do the whole, would you switch the bomb for the other boat scene? And like, it's a great scene because you, you, you always will end up asking yourself the same question. Would you turn it? Yeah. And here's a movie where I think like any movie, you're putting yourself into the shoes of the experience of the characters, but you're like, Oh my God, which one do I like? It, it unsettles you to see yourself in any of this. And that could mm -hmm. unease people. And I, I, and I appreciate her, her chutzpah for doing that. Yeah. I think I, uh, it comes out on prime video in a few days. So I think a rewatch will be very helpful for me on this. Right now, I think I've kind of said where I stand, but I'm open to that changing. So we'll see. We'll see. I think you're definitely, this is the biggest gap we've had in our opinions thus far. And I think we're probably going to head into another gap right now. Uh, Ma Maestro, Maestro, however you say it. Maestro. Um, Maestro. Minestro. Minestro. Um, <laughs> I already, I have a video review out there detailing all of my thoughts on this film. I don't think we've heard your thoughts on it, so I'll let you begin. What did, I think you, you liked it a little more than me. What did you think of it? Oh, yeah. Um, this is dad. Um, yeah, I, again, Carrie Mulligan, do no wrong. I think this yeah. might be her best performance um, of her she career. She carries this film. She carries. Um, she. I, I just thought this was such a beautiful portrait of living a lie and coming to terms with that. Um, I think that Bradley Cooper takes very similarly the approach that Damien Chazelle did with First Man and taking a biopic and really understanding the emotional weight and gravitas of what goes on with these historic figures. Mm -hmm. uh, he is not necessarily interested in Bernstein's career. Uh, you yeah. see it touched upon, um, but really that's the backdrop for this story about his family. And I, what I really like about this and what I loved about First Man is it really understands the weight of creativity and that there are certain things that we feel that are a part of everyday life and part of our social lives that we couldn't live without, that these people often have to sacrifice in order to be these people. And had we focused on all of his accomplishments, if we saw a scene of him, you know, creating West Side Story and all these things, then the movie would be saying that, you know, there was a cost and there's an even weight to this. We don't get those scenes. And instead we just live in the turmoil of this family dynamic. The fact that he has often had to not be honest with his children. I thought a great scene with him and Maya Hawk, who I think was really great here. Um, so I really appreciated how this movie just focused in on this family unit. Um, it was sensual and stunning. I thought the cinematography was absolutely yeah, breathtaking. Yeah. Honestly, like I've heard myself gasp multiple times throughout this movie. I think it's it's 
similarly to marriage story i think it's a it's a heartbreaking love story in many ways and mm -hmm. i really admired how cooper as a director really captured this constant pulling of the thread of who this person was and and constantly trying to figure out who he was knowing that there was easy answers as far as who he was but never feeling comfortable in either one um i thought he, it was a very clever film in many ways uh speaking of snoop there's a clever thing with snoopy yep. that i just perfect um yeah and to be honest i'm excited to see this again it comes out on netflix um i believe by the time you're all watching this it's on netflix yeah yeah because i was so taken visually with the movie that there were some points where yes it's probably not the most challenging film or confronting film but i felt it understood. so understood what it was like to be in this to be in this uh dynamic to be in this relationship to have these experiences i thought he so captured what that was so effectively that it really like it punctured me the same way that all that jazz has uh, hit me the same way that tar hit me because these are capturing the lives of these individuals and the the joys of their life coupled with the, just the and just the innate sadness that comes with a lot of these experiences that I just really really enjoyed I really enjoyed this movie um yeah and I think Bradley Cooper as a director is just sensational he does yeah. what a director should do because he fully puts you compared to Saltburn you know in our conversation there he mm -hmm. fully captures you within the point of view of these characters and what it was like to be them and live as them and exist together. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, that's much true. It was one of my favorites of the year for that reason. I won't go too deep onto my thoughts because if you want like a full breakdown of them, there is a video out there for it that um, I can link down below. But I admire, kind of similar to Salford, I admire a lot of the technical aspects of this film. Like you said, the cinematography is incredible. Um, there is some of it that I think is just showy to be showy for showy's sake. Like there's a six minute conducting scene that's here in the background right now that <laughs> I didn't know why it needed to be so long and just sweeping through the entire audience outside of just being a like showy long shot. Um, I like the the um, Bradley Cooper ending. wants an Oscar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what most of this film feels like, at least his scenes. I think Harry Mulligan is, if you connect to this film, I think that is where you most likely connect especially in the third act i think she steals the third the third act is where i think the film works the best for me mm -hmm. um because i think that's where it's the most connected to the characters itself i know a lot of biopics focus on like like events and careers and like jump from like one important event in a person's career to another event to another event with not much like things tying those together i think this is similar except it's jumping from one point in a marriage to another point in a marriage to another point and i think there needs to be more connection between them, in my opinion. I think there were moments that I could have I could have used it to um it didn't seem very focused, is what I'd say. I, I think it was a little um going through the motions at times, just like, oh, we have to have this scene and then we're gonna have this scene and this scene. Um I would the third say act is just to okay. that point, I think part of what worked about it with me is this idea that there wasn't a lot of connection at some points. Like there were probably distances of time where they were leading completely different lives, but they still felt tethered to each other. And this idea that why can't I like leave this? Why do I have to stay connected to this? You know, we're both not happy. Um, and that dichotomy is what I think this movie is essentially about. Yes, I do think there are moments where like, oh my God, time has passed. Um, okay. But I don't, it's, they worked for me. I think the, uh, a key moment is when, you know, they first kind of fall in love and then the next scene they're married in that scene yeah. where time has passed, Carrie Mulligan is telling us all about his accomplishments and he's doing a, a, a musical with the Mr. Young mm -hmm. Snapper, Mr. Stephen Sondheim. And to me yeah. that, that scene works because, oh my God, she, to show that there's been history between them, she's now reading off his resume as if that's what this relationship has achieved. It's allowed him this career. I thought, mm -hmm. I thought Cooper did cleverly came up with really interesting ways to show the passage of time and show how these two were like they were just like trapped in this sort of death spiral with the two of them like there was no way they could exist apart from each other despite what they may might have said to each other mm -hmm. yeah i think i also had trouble connecting to it at first because the black and white scenes i really did struggle with it felt like 
both the actors and Cooper like crafting and creating this film, um, were going a little too hard in trying to capture like that old timey feel. It almost felt like a little bit of an mm -hmm. act rather than realistic to me. It felt like they were like doing the old Hollywood voices and trying to capture that, and it didn't feel quite realistic. So I struggled to connect with the characters at that point because it all just felt like they were putting up a front. But then once it switches to color, I, I did connect to the characters more. And then especially once we hit the third act where Carrie Mulligan's character goes through. It's based on real life, but I won't spoil it. A um, <laughs> change in her life. And I think that brings them much closer together. And I think that's where the relationship drama, which is what this film is truly focused on, the relationship. I think that's when it works the best, when they come back mm -hmm. together at the end. Because um, it feels a little aimless leading up to that point, in my opinion. But um, I also, I'm not completely sure how I feel about how it handles her character in the end. I think, I don't know. It felt like she was kind of more of a um i mean it's based on real life so i can't really uh judge it for that it felt like she was kind of a, a mo an emotional tool for his arc rather than her um I, I just don't completely love the way they handled her at the end but i also don't think in terms of bradley cooper and his character and the way they show his sexuality i think could have been a little more front i didn't i don't think it was a little um it didn't show it's, it wasn't as teethy as i would have liked it um it doesn't completely commit to it it kind of just touches on it i think i think it's a big struggle for him and i think that's what causes a lot of the issues in their relationships um there's one great scene surrounding it with carrie mulligan and um this is bradley cooper's um new male love interest who's just hanging around with the family um mm -hmm. at like i forget what they're at like an opera or something uh, there's one shot on carrie mulligan in particular that one take i will say yeah very good um but yeah i i think they could have um showed a little more teeth in terms of showing all that um but i also think yeah. that what i appreciate about this is that cooper really holds on a shot and i think he uses time yes. very well because he understands that argument he can't pass through like that when he's not honest with his daughter about his sexuality i think another director would have cut sooner i think he allows mm -hmm. these moments to really ruminate and uncomfortably yeah. so because these characters are living fragments of lives and i think he okay. uses time so well I, there's an opening shot where you think you're in a stage and you realize you're in a bedroom yeah. and it shows the how linked uh bernstein is to his performing life the the, mm -hmm. the the he does it twice where he runs like into like he runs into a an auditorium and like a theater very uh, in a very you know uh fun way I, I yeah. think he, he just really, I really felt that more than most movies this year, I was looking through the eyes of these characters and that this is an emotional piece. It's not a film that, it's probably the closest thing an American filmmaker this year has come to crafting something that feels more European. It's something that it's more focused on the lived experience. It's more focused on what they see rather than what they say or what they do. It's not a film that's focused mm -hmm. on action. It's a film that's focused on being, and he captures that so, so just devastatingly. I just this one again. It's 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 a it's a tone piece that I think he orchestrated beautifully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will agree. I appreciate his um the way him and Matthew Lipatique for a lot of the shots choose to just like that argument scene is I think one of the best scenes of the film. Um, and that works, I think, mostly because it's one singular shot as they move around in the frame, rather than these cuts to close ups and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's very effective. And I do think it also hurts the movie in other scenes, the way they choose to ruminate and stay on, I think, some scenes and shots for a little too long. I think it hurts. I think pacing is an issue here as well with the film. Um, I think it could have been edited and paced a little better. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't want to I think I've expressed most of my thoughts here and then in the separate video. So any final thoughts on Maestro? <laughs> uh, see, I try to see it in theaters. That's my big Yes, part, yes I would agree. Stunning, yeah. stunning, stunning, stunning. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes. Another movie that I have given my thoughts on that I don't really, I don't need to talk about much, but I don't, I don't know how much you've covered your thoughts on this film. Poor Things. What, what did you think of Poor Things? I thought this was a film that really existed in two camps quite successfully. At its at its center, it's a very simple story of coming of age. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was so interesting is you really see Emma Stone age 35 years in two hours, and that is an acting feat. Um, yeah. But a lot of what you see in this film is a lot what you see in other coming of age movies. But at the same time, Yorgos Lanthimos, I think, is rewriting film language 
in really exciting ways because he's really you know breaking down what is expected certain contrivances for certain stories and he just breaks them and applies them to this story tony mcnamara's screenplay mm -hmm. does that as well um i thought this was just so wildly freeing in a way that you could not help but to admire because they were just there was just a frivolity to this movie that i was just incredible incredible to witness um i do think that my one critique with it was that it's i feel like it's a, it's a very male it's a it's a it's a it's a male point of view type of thing yeah you look at a woman's sexuality and her and her her freedom of her sexual self being tied to their coming of age and their liberation mm -hmm. emotionally um yeah Again, I was like watching this. I, I'm like, I don't think I'm a prude, but there's a lot of sex in this movie. There's a lot, um, yeah. But other than that, and again, because I, I, and I think they're able to bring those issues down a little bit because Bella Baxter is just such an interesting character, and what Emma Stone does is so interesting here. Yeah. Um, how it, she explores um, herself, what love is, what um, pain is, class. Um, there's just uh, so many things about her development. Uh, I loved the, I, this is another movie where I love the black and white to color switch. Cause I really like mm -hmm. that she's seeing the world with more, um, detail yeah, yeah. and specificity. And yeah, it's, it, again, it's, if I explained what I think the movie's saying, it seems very simple and like we've mm -hmm. seen this before, but it's what I think is so wonderful is that by taking this outlandish approach to a simple story it gives us an insight into the human experience that we haven't seen before um and specifically yeah. about this desire to recapture childhood and, and what's it like to go through these experiences when we don't have to posture with adultism um and trying to look through things um in a more just adult way in a more professional way like she it it's very specific and i just loved the childlike perspective onto this world um and then of course the craft the score the sound design everything about yeah. this this is yeah. really immersive it's one of the most immersive film worlds of the year so yeah i think this is the one that the more i think about it the more i'm just i just i really admire what they pulled off here this is a bold way to tell a coming of age story um and one that I think maybe has more truth in it than the majority of the other ones, because it's unafraid to tackle a lot of things about what it's like to actually come of age. Yeah, I agree. I mean, craft elements, I think it's one of the best technically crafted films of the year, production design, costume design, um, the whole aesthetic that it creates, um, the kind of like futuristic, steampunky, classical look, I think is stunning. Um, and beautiful to behold. Um, the performances, Emma Stone, this is really her showcase. She does an incredible job. I mean, everyone said it. I've said it before. I mean, I don't really need, need to go into it. One of the best performances of the year. I love seeing Mark Ruffalo doing something that we haven't really gotten to see him do before. I think he's the comedic standout of the film. He's very funny. Uh, Willem Dafoe, kind of like an emotional heart of the film as the father figure, I think very unexpected. If you go into this film not knowing anything, the way his character plays out. Um, and yeah, I think the main issue I have with it is the the pacing isn't all there. I think it I think it meanders a little bit in that area you're talking about in particular where um Bella Baxter, I don't want to spoil anything, but sex becomes a big part of her life. And I think there's one or two scenes there that um not because they have sex in them, but just because I think they get a little repetitive, that could have been cut. I think that's what might make it feel a little more um intense or over the top, is because I don't think all of those sex scenes were necessary. I think you could have done one or two less and gotten the point across. And I think that's at the point in the script where um, it slows down a little bit. So I think that might hurt as well. Um, that's really my main issue with it. And it does feel like it comes to a conclusion. And then it has like a little twisty thing. And then there's like 15 minutes left. I agree. Um, a, little, a little final extra thing that's like, oh, okay, I didn't see this coming. And I, th I can understand the purpose of that final little twist for her, the ending of her character arc. It just did come a little out of nowhere and was kind of off-putting, but um, I understand it, and I don't have too many gripes with it. Um, I think Gerard Carmichael is another thing that didn't completely work for me. He doesn't seem to be on the wavelength as the same wavelength as everyone else in the film. He maybe it's I don't I don't think it's he's the only one really not doing a like British accent. A lot of them are doing some weird British accents. Um, but he just I think it would have been better if that 
character was instead the older character, the older woman character who he was with. I think it would have been nicer having an older woman in part like the realities of the world onto mm -hmm. Emma, onto Bella Baxter's character rather than Gerard Carmichael, who just seems very monotone in his delivery. Honestly, I just, I think it could have worked better from that other character's perspective rather than his. This felt like a movie that would have title cards. They're like chapter one, Bella it kind of does. Yeah. yeah. It, um, it has location cards. That's true. That's right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. I just think, everything you said is true i think that it's uh, i think the pacing is a little off i think 20 minutes here and there cut a couple of sex scenes yeah. um is it again the sex scenes contribute to the movie but after a while it's not because they're sex yeah. scenes it's because it's repetitive it's like okay yeah. we we understand the purpose of these scenes and to her yeah. art the story um but, yeah. so yeah i think again your gross lanthimos i think he's he's constantly telling Our stories that you think you've seen but with such why I think similar to Maestro in a completely different way, they just show you the power that a director have, really do. Yeah, yeah. And do you want to quickly touch on Zone? Or Let me hold back on Zone because I think I want to yeah. see Zone again. Um, yeah. Zone of Interest, I think it's a movie that doesn't have a lot of plot. It's about existing with the characters, and given that I was I was again expecting a little bit more gradients to the movie, it's. A lot of what you expect to be in the foreground is in the background. And I think now that I know that, I'm interested to go back in um, and really seek, like, seep into it. Because I, I do think that what Jonathan Glazer is saying is quite effective if you're prepared for that sort of narrative device. So I'm going to hold off a little bit because um, it didn't really work for me on the first viewing. I did feel it, at some point I was like, all right. I get it. It's similar to the sex scenes and poor things. I was like, all right, this is one idea they keep doing over and over and over again. Um, but I, I want to see it a second time. I think it deserves that. So I'll, I'll hold off on any more thoughts. I look forward to seeing it. And lastly, quick thoughts. Origin, what do you think? Yes, I was very privileged. I saw the last screening in New York before this movie is sheltered away for about a month and a half. Until mid-January, um, yeah. So weird. Um, and I think, unfortunately, because I think this is a stunning film. I think David DuVernay, it's her greatest work yet. Um, this is such an achievement that it's, like, I felt, like, you poor things felt like your ghost lantern was kind of re, like redefining cinema language this is changing the form of how to tell a story the way she integrates true history with the narrative the narrative it's it's you know it's based on a true story about this woman just yeah. writing this book but you know the, the taking the true stuff with the narrative stuff i it was just so stunning um i thought that Anjanu ellis taylor is just quietly devastating in her performance at other points she is full of life and joy this is such an incredible ensemble cast uh audrey mcdonald who i love as a broadway uh star comes in for five minutes and delivers such a powerful monologue uh this is a movie that talks about the interconnectivity of culture and how we're all connected and certain things that you may feel are separate and the desire to live separate lives can lead to the reduction of existence and this movie does such a beautiful job of showing how oppression is not it's it's definitely generational but it is just humane and it, it and it hits us all in in ways that may comfort us to know that it's similar because it means that other people understand the pain that what we're going through it's kind of similar to the holdovers in that way um yeah, yeah i just thought this was such an just an interesting and fascinating way to tell this story um it makes what could be a homework assignment told with such thrilling tension and mm -hmm. i think it is one of the most interesting films made this year i think that it's a film that everybody should see they should teach this film in schools um just there were i there were moments that had me completely engrossed and other moments that had me just crying d filling up with tears so um when origin comes out please please seek this out it is one of a kind and i think definitely a film that it it, it is the, it is the film of the year in many ways not saying it's like the best film of the year but it's yeah. a film that i think represents the time and place we're at today yeah 
I look forward to seeing it and Zone of Interest whenever they hit my, hopefully hit my movie theater near me. Seems like they're a little connected to the, with themes as well. So yeah, yeah. it'll be an interesting discussion. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it for what we've seen. Any any final th films you've seen recently you want to throw out there? Or is that that's pretty much it? I mean, I, I saw The Boy and the Heron. What a magical world he created oh, with that one. That. Really beautifully mm -hmm. animated. And then, you know, Christmas movies. I saw Last Christmas again. It's my closet favorite Ooh. Christmas movie. I love yeah. that movie. It's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> Amelia Clark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a controversial one, but I, I, I lean on the positive side on that one. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. If, I, I, I don't know if there's, I saw wish. I don't like it. So I don't need to really touch on that. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I'm sure we'll do another one of these um, in a few weeks, month or so. Um, once we've seen, I think it'll probably be our final one. Once we've seen like color purple, the final, final releases of the year. Um, so yeah. American, oh my God, I still need to see it. Yeah, American fiction. It's a big one. But yeah, thank you all for watching. Um, comment your thoughts on any of the films that we talked about here down below. Um, like the video, subscribe, stay tuned for more award season coverage. We're getting towards the end of the year. We're going to have our top tens of the year soon ish once we've seen all of what we've need to see. <laughs> have our own awards well once again once we've seen all we've need to see and then of course we're going to be talking about all the award season stuff um we got sag nominations coming soon we got the short list coming later this week uh and then nominations in like a month or so insane um so yeah stay tuned for all of that fun stuff where can they find you on the internet and logging all of the films you've seen Anthony? listen you know where to find me on twitter at anthony underscore post and letterbox and yeah, I'm, I was very excited. I know a lot of people have been asking for our thoughts on these movies. Um, so yes. hopefully you enjoyed, hopefully you enjoyed our ramblings. <laughs> yes, yes. It's funny, well, I think yeah. a lot of these movies are similar when I think about like they're, a lot of, a lot of these movies are yeah. very director oriented. And I think they really, what I, I think I appreciated about all these is that you really felt that you were in the, minds of the characters and i think a lot of times that's i, I think that's what's, what's making 2023 such an interesting year is that yeah. they're really character driven pieces even the movies that maybe don't work for you as much as salt burn like it they're they're very much focusing on what was it actually like emotionally for the characters to go through these experiences and i find that really interesting and that's what i love about movies so that's why i was pretty on board with all these yeah. things we talked about <laughs> yeah is maestro your favorite of the ones we talked about before we go that is a good question. Um, I would quick. I think of the ones we talked about, Anatomy of a Fall is probably either that or Poor Things is probably. My I favorite. might. I think Origin is actually my favorite. Oh wow, nice, nice. Mm. I need to yeah, see it. Mice was up there. Poor Things. I mean, listen, they're all. There's no, no movie we talked about in depth today that I did not enjoy. Um, and again, I want to mm -hmm. give Zone of Interest another try now that I'm more because that was the case with Under the Skin. I was like. I don't know about this. And then yeah. a couple of days later, I was like, I see you. I see you, Glazer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe on rewatch, I will enjoy Saltburn or Maestro. So we'll see. we'll see. We'll see. I'll keep you updated on it if that happens, everyone. Um, so yeah, thank you all for watching. Like, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.